Hey, what's up, everybody? Danny Jessup here with Cameron Bodley, and we are excited to jump in on another episode of the Consult ROI podcast here. And we're excited today to talk about kind of just really building off of what we've talked about over the past several episodes. And today it's it's leading into really kind of speeding up when everyone else is slowing down. And so there's a lot of loom right now, kind of like doom and gloom. The news is experts at that, you know, their job is to get you to come back and, and watch the next story and everything else like that. And, uh, you know, are we going to make it to the next 30 minutes or not? Is the world going to end? And uh, you're really, I like to, to kind of dive into a quote from Warren Buffett, but uh, as we do, want to add a little disclaimer that the only thing I'm licensed is to drive a car. So, uh, you know, take whatever we talk about here today as your own and do with it what you will, uh, but not, uh, you know, secure financial advice or anything like that. But, uh, you know, the lay people like us is out here having, you know, high level friendly conversations. You know, what does that look like? And let's kind of dive a, a couple layers deeper into that. So um, as we do kind of dive into this, um, uh, just kind of thinking about what that looks like and things. And so with Warren Buffett, he once said that it's wise for investors to be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. And it seems like we've kind of seen this ebb and flow, uh, at least, uh, you know, in, in my lifetime, uh, especially since uh, the 2008 recession. And with that 2008 recession, it was kind of fascinating to me that everybody is talking about a looming recession, this looming recession. And what if we have a recession? And nobody was talking about being in the eye of the storm. And then like a switch flipped. And then all of a sudden, this quote unquote looming recession was talked about in past tense almost overnight where nobody took ownership of it during. It was only looming. And then all of a sudden it was talked about in this past tense. And now we're seeing history repeat itself in our day and time now of this potentially looming recession. And, uh, and it's only a matter of time, I think, when the, the media out there will all of a sudden say, since the recession hit, since the post-pandemic recession hit, or whatever else they're, they're going to want to call that. And it's not very long since 2008. And Cameron, what do you think? I, I, I think that like a lot of the people have short attention spans and even shorter memories, right? Well, I, I think it's a clever verbiage when people don't want to admit that they were wrong. Um, so that's typically why you see the change of verbiage because they won't admit they're wrong. They're like, oh yeah, it was just that little short time or period where we had a couple months. And, that, and technically by definition, a couple of months or a couple quarters in a row is a recession, um, which we already have had, right? We just haven't had the Great Depression, which is another story or can of worms. Um, but as we all know in economics, our system and as we proved with 2020 and other examples our economy and our logistics infrastructure is pretty fragile um, it doesn't take much for a pretty good interruption to to occur uh, which means that heaven forbid something does happen like that there's some other overreach or something to that extent um, you need to be aware and while we are both not licensed to talk about uh, financial advice, there's still some sound financial advice um, that is pretty much universal, universal in all religions, universal in all like corporate and business infrastructure, like manage and delegate your finances appropriately and responsibly. Sure. sure. So um, what that means is either way, you need to be able to have at least a few months um, and be able to delegate and spend responsibly to, to do that. Now, have I always done that? Probably not. Um, in fact, I and definitely not. Um, I've taken risks. I've taken risks that literally made, made meant that I was either going to make it or crash and burn really hard. And I've done both. Um, but I went into it understanding the risks, the risks of that. Of it, right, right. Exactly. So the biggest key is understanding. And that's that's also the biggest reason that you'll see a lot of these uh, crypto scams and a lot of these um, other get rich quick investments. Um, NFTs is another bit, great example of that. Um, all really stupid advice. Again, just like Danny talked about. Um, when everybody is talking about it fanatically, 
then that's when you exercise an excessive amount of caution. It's the same thing that I'm still practicing even right now with cryptocurrency, um, with any cryptocurrency, um, even in the main market. Right now, it's a gamble. It's just like the dot-com bust. I'm not saying that Bitcoins or cryptos uh, would not be able to hold a placeholder in our society at one point. Um, having something that is, it, it's, but essentially the only time that it's actually going to truly catch on as an actual form of currency is when a government or something else starts recognizing it and accepting it. Now, there's some businesses that have started to accept certain ones, but it doesn't change that that is still something that is not a solid or safe investment right it has no tangible value literally if somebody hacked it it would lose its value like that um there's nothing else even the dollar technically is not backed by any monetary asset like gold um however it is backed by the u.s government so it's a lot safer than a lot of other things because the u.s government isn't for better or worse isn't going around or, or away anytime soon, right? It's one, sure, probably sure. one of the more safe, <laughs> safe yeah. things out there. Yeah, there's so, a lot of talk lot of, of uh, different digital currencies and stuff like that, you know. And everybody, and I love that you um, you kind of tied that to, you know, the, the kind of the, the crypto lay of the land. There could kind of be like the dot com bust, right? Like we might see, you know, this ebb and flow of a lot of them, and then like poof. Many of them we've already seen, like kind of disappear or mismanage their funds or or things like that. But then uh, there's a few that kind of remain true and strong and and whatnot. Then you know, it'd be interesting to kind of see you know how all that stuff shakes out. But back to your point, of, there's a lot of risk out there. There's a lot of well, understanding. How many of the dot? Had, most right? people aren't weren't even alive during the dot com. That are probably listening to this. To be to be frank. Um, <laughs> But it's just like the cryptos. And that's the reason I'm bringing that up today is because with cryptos, there's literally just in the last year alone has been well over 12,000 different types of currencies created and that different crypto and 12,000 minimum. We're not talking conservative. That's that's minimum. <laughs> that we're made. Amazing. It's overwhelming. Um, yeah, exactly. And so logically, we have to look at it and say, there's no way feasible that any of these or even the majority of these are going to be successful. That's what happened in the dot-com bust is there was a lot of different ventures, not nearly to the scale or, or anything that we have today. Um, but that's because also everything is radicalized almost uh, and immediately viral in the social media environment that we live today. So what that means is, again, and everyone's like, I already know that there's going to be that one few person that listens to it and says, oh, well, that means that Bitcoin's going to be one of them. And I'm like, no, no, it's, it's literally the government could create one next week and say, hey, this is the only one that's going to be considered. And basically, we're going to put policies on the rest to say that they're no longer allowed like China did. And everything but that one would retain value. They could literally make the US dollar cryptocurrency and that because they've been trying to talk about how we need to be create more trackable income and that because they want to track every single penny that they give you or you give your kids or whatever else for Christmas um, and count it. Um, but we won't get into that. Either way, that is essentially the goal and it only takes something like that which in today's world you should not be surprised if something like that happens and that means that again everything else would be irrelevant and worthless and you would lose your shirt so can you make money in it sure will is it the safest and is it pretty decent gamble still today absolutely <laughs> um so right. it is what it is. It's the same reason that NFTs went down the hole and all those other things. But um, when you do uh, see a lot of this, uh, like for example, in business, honestly, investing, so investing in yourself and investing in a business, especially if it's a trades or service business, and that is probably one of the safer things that you can do. Yeah, always on uh, yourself, so. right? Number one, right? Uh, every single successful person or uh, someone that I've 
that I've seen has achieved success, they said it happened when I went all in on myself first, right? Kind of like the classic airline example, right? Put on your mask before helping others. And so you've got to get yourself, you know, in a, in a good way, in a good spot to be able to know and, you know, how to help not only yourself, but then the world around you. So yeah, number one, for sure. Well, how many people are accountable to themselves? That's, that's also a, a reality check. And a lot of people could never be their own boss because the moment that everything is contingent on them for how much they make, how much they do, how much they work and everything else, a lot of people, this default is literally being lazy, sitting on their butt. Yeah, and they function um, by being told what to do or having yeah. that structure around them, right? There's nothing wrong with the, like, we need employees regardless. Um, it's a vital symbi symbiotic relationship, right? Um, for example, as a CEO, my job is to manage the vision of the company. Hey, 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 here's the grand scheme of it. This is what I would like to accomplish and everything else. I also have that right brain and that the very logical black and white decisions and being able to make certain calls and decisions. But I need somebody that's creative to handle marketing, right? I don't have necessarily, I have the idea and say, hey, here's kind of what I want to capture. Here's the feel I want to capture and everything else. Here's a little scribble on a napkin that looks like ass. And then I will hand it to that person and everything. And they'll be like, oh, this looks like crap. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Just fix it. But they have that ability <laughs> to do that. Um, but it's it's because they have that skill set. They have that uniqueness that I need to be able to up to that level. Now, that could be a contractor. That could be another person as well, in all fairness. However, having somebody that is like a CMO in your organization that ties in and has that complementary skill set to do both is great. Just the same as... If I'm handling the organization, the logistics and everything else, having somebody like you that is um, like the sales uh, and operations and uh, customer service manager uh, on that end, um, we're with customer experience and everything to that import, uh, importance, because that's vital in making sure that whatever clients that come in are retained properly, right? Right. And yeah. Having the right people in the right seats on the in the organization, right? And so it's not a bad thing to be want to be an employee because and there is a lot of people out there that have more of an entrepreneur spirit meaning that they love to be creative they love to have some of that freedom and everything um, kind of like in our organization where like i just say hey take over this and i let you do whatever it is and and i trust that person enough to to build it up to where it needs to be um and be part of the journey if you will uh but there's also so there, there there's also the 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 importance on the other the other end though to understand uh, that the entrepreneurship and that does require a lot of risk it re requires a lot of self-accountability and discipline and other things and when you're an entrepreneur you don't have to necessarily worry about those risks, right? Because at the end of the day, you're still going to get a paycheck for as long as you're there until you're fired. Mm. Um, <laughs> but if you, like, I don't execute on my vision, I lose my butt, right? That's the reality. And a lot of people aren't comfortable with it. They're not sure of themselves enough. And I think a lot of it has to do with they've never had to do something like that before. And so it's pushing themselves. But when the times are good, it's very easy to be like, hey, I want to go on vacations. I want to do all these fun things. I want to relax. And those are good things, right? Sure. But I believe also that they should be um, not as frequent as everybody thinks, right? I, I believe that maybe once a month for a weekend or you do once a quarter and that for like a week vacation, something like that, where you have something to strive for, look forward to, et cetera. But the rest of the time needs to be consistent action getting towards your goal. And I also believe that it's dependent on what kind of business or organization that you want to build, right? Are you trying to build a lifestyle business where it just supports you 
doing your things or are you trying to build an empire? I'm trying to build an empire. So uh, my actions are going to be tied to that, not tied to the lifestyle necessarily. Um, right. I say that as I have a race motorcycle right now and some other <laughs> stuff. But <laughs> right, you know, you still enjoy things on along I, I the way. That was a, that's that's exactly right. right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, kind of like uh, back to that that point there of uh, you know, be fearful when others are greedy, greedy when others are fearful. Um, we kind of see like this little bit of that shift, you know, and it might not be exactly right now today, but perhaps within the next twelve months. You know, that uh, that greedy when others are fearful, if you've been prepared and disciplined, you know, to your point of the long term game, the empire game, uh, you know, you're ready to strike when that iron is hot. And that iron might not, not might just be hot for just a, a limited period of time when others are scaling back and trying to be a little bit more conservative. If you're prepared, like you, you'll be able ready to dominate. Well, again, success is when preparation meets opportunity yes okay? so it's not magically like oh hey if i ever magically happen and get lucky and come across a business deal that trusts me to do this then i'll go all in on my business stream um which it does work for some people but at that point typically what you find is that they're winging it um and they don't provide a very good quality of service and they've already started business off on the wrong foot, right? Whereas if they were preparing up to that point, um, and this goes for business and life, even in marriage, right? If you're just dating to fling around and do all these things and just have fun, as opposed to finding an internal partner, you're going to end up getting in a toxic relationship that doesn't work. And now not only do you pay for it, but your kids pay for it and everybody else associated with pays for it. It could end up impacting um, generations, right? Exactly. Um, and that's not really something everyone wants to talk about. It's like, oh yeah, well, she went psycho. She did this and everything else. Or, I mean, that's that happens all the time. Same vice versa, right? Oh, he was just a, a jerk. He cheated. He did all this other stuff. I'm like, you kind of saw the signs before it happened in that, or he played dumb and ignored them. Like th there's a lot of signs in business and relationships and everything else that does that. And we have to take a hundred percent accountability for everything. So it doesn't matter if I mess up or one of my employees mess up, it's still my fault. Cause I'm the one running the organization. I'm the As one the doing leader. it. Yes, exactly. Now it could be my fault for thinking or trusting that person too much. Sometimes it could be my fault because I didn't train them properly or I thought that they were more prepared than they were, or um, maybe I just put my trust in everything and was like, hey, you know what, this person stole from me. Um, what can I do to do that? But at least I learned the lesson now before it became a lot more expensive, like um, down the road, right? One amount of money, yeah. Because the more successful you are, the more money you're dealing with. And right. <laughs> so yeah, and I'd rather mean, learn really the lesson of... now than later on with that person that then would have access to a lot more. And um, that's probably the epitome of that mo money, mo problems, right? Because it's like if you're not prepared to manage your finances or your leadership or your training or whatever it is that you have stewardship over now, how do you think you're going to react and be anything different when it's scaled and on a grander scale? Um, yeah, no, it makes complete sense. So with, uh, we can even talk about, about a time in your life that, uh, where you've had to scale back and everything, or you decided to pick it up when everybody else was, um, so I, I know for, for example, even for me, it was a big thing where when everybody was cynical of me, um about starting a business and everybody uh looked at me and says oh you'll never be successful you'll never do this and everything that to me honestly was fuel and helped me persevere even when i didn't want to um because of the fact that i could never ever let them prove me wrong and i was going to do whatever i needed to if i had to pivot 
or change it. And success might not have looked like it did originally um, when I stepped into it, but I was able to pivot, adapt, and overcome these obstacles extremely quickly um, and got very, very good at problem solving uh, because of that time in my life and that of being willing to, like, you know what, I'm going to, again, keep my iron in the fire and make sure that I'm prepped. So when is the time in your life in that where you've had that and and what did you do to kind of push through or persevere or did you not? And did you um, just learn a lesson from it? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, if uh, it could, you know, I think that's the the value and the wisdom in it all is learning the lesson from it, right? On either side of that coin, for right. sure. Right. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think about like my own situation back in 2008. Um, I mean, it was, it was ugly where I was working. Uh, the business model, no thanks to our leadership, uh, one specific quote unquote CEO leader that we had uh, that uh, single handedly had uh, basically bankrupt the company that we were working at and uh, saw the, the tip of the iceberg on the wall. And so in the middle of all that changed jobs in a down recession, I was grateful to be able to, you know, have that uh, success and opportunity meet to where I had still kept my head up, kept my skills up and everything there. And I was able to find a, another good job uh, during that time, but it came at a cost financially. Uh, I think at least a 35% hit, if I remember right, might've been even been a little bit more. Um, and so to your point earlier, uh, being able to kind of like survive uh, a certain times, you kind of claw your way back, uh, back through that. And that's what I was able to do is uh, not only kind of change, change career paths um, uh, from one to another, but it also was a good, valuable lesson to uh, one, never burn a bridge, uh, you know, despite our fearless leader running us into the ground and things. It was some of the relationships outside of him that I had made that I still keep in contact with uh, decades later today uh, that have been very meaningful to me. But yeah, to, to never burn a bridge, uh, to keep working through that. But then also it was a good lesson of living within means so that we didn't, uh, you know, lose it all, so to speak, uh, as we kind of had to more or less rebuild and, and come through that process. And so uh, for me, I think that was also a time that uh, was really uh, a great learning experience to kind of flush out of what's the value, what's the education, what's the lesson here? Because a lot of times it's it's not always about the money. Yes, we did take a hit financially as a family and uh, as a, an income and, and things like that. But I earned that back uh, in other ways of the education and, and realizing the value in that education of changing organizations, people I worked with, learning new products and services and different ways to help uh, differentiate myself to dive deeper into what I could do to provide a good quality product and service to those that I worked with. I've learned that when you get paid less, it usually means that uh, they can provide you more value than you can provide them. When they pay insanely well, right? That's when they, um, you are at the top of your game in that, but you don't really learn anything, right? Mm -hmm. You're an organization that's willing to pay for that value and that, but they don't really have anything else to give you or, or pour into you because they're already expecting you to be the expert in your field. And so it's kind of that balance act, right? That, that, um, it's the same thing with my friends and that, for that matter, uh, in the business world. So obviously you're coming from more of the employee side and I'm coming from sure, more of the business sure. running side. Yep, so yep. I've noticed that if I don't surround myself by more successful people than I am, if I'm the most successful person in that room, whenever I meet somewhere, um, that's a problem. I feel the same, <laughs> right? Like I don't like that. I really do not like that feeling at all. And a lot of people are like, what are you talking about? That's like a good feeling. And I'm like, yeah, maybe the first time it happens, but then ever after time, like it gets worse and worse and worse because you're like, I am not growing. I am That's not. Exactly growing. right. Where's the growth and development there for sure. Exactly. In fact, uh, I was, uh, recently, um, uh, meeting with a, uh, a group of sales professionals, uh, in another state. And um, I asked, like, hey, do any of you join? Uh, are you any of you part of masterminds? And there was actually several of them that were like, what's that? 
and they couldn't exactly articulate to themselves what a mastermind was, which is which is fine. Everybody's different in their journey, um, but it also kind of was a good reality check of like, you know, if to that point, if I'm the smartest person in the room, which I wouldn't ever claim to be, um, I've got to find a bigger room, right? So as a as a good reality check of one, perhaps I can lead with some value to help them. Not understand a bigger what, room, just a better quality room. Higher quality, sure. Right, and so uh, this is like yeah. you could go to a community college, and that, and you might find a couple geniuses that are just in the wrong school. But chances are, you, if you go to Ivy League, you're gonna find more, right? Um, but sure. the other point, I've met idiots that went to Ivy League, and I've met geniuses that were homeless. Um, the difference was, and the difference really is in most people, and whether they're successful or not, or whether they're able to execute on a vision, is grit. That's really the reality is, is if you want to be successful, whether as an employee, whether as anything else, when the going gets tough, how much grit do you have to persevere and be willing to do that? Um, the reason that you were able to pivot and learn a lot in that is because instead of sitting there feeling and throwing yourself a poor pity party, which I'm sure there was a little bit, right? We all have that bitter contentment, sure. like, you know, it sucks and that, I can't believe this guy did this and everything else and I'm forced to do this. But at the other end of it, you still chose and clearly by actions and that slowly over time to be like, hey, you know what? I want to make the best out of this situation. I want to be the most valuable asset I can in this new job and that. And I want to learn all I can and scale up, which has now allowed you to make a substantial amount of money in your career. And that you're definitely one of the higher paid guys in that in at least your field um, as a result of the, being a, willing to humble yourself. Yeah, and I'm I'm grateful for that. It's in a, it's been a great way to be able to differentiate myself at the same time, right? And so, yeah, I look at all these things as a, it's an opportunity for education. Kind of looking at every day as an education, and every day is a job interview. And if I'm invited back, you know, I've made the cut for another day. And what value can I bring to the, the organization, or to my colleagues, or to someone else that I'm working with? And and where can we go together? Well, that's the other thing, too. It goes back to our station, you know, when I met um, unintentionally knowing that I met a multi, well, he's now a multi-billionaire, uh, had no clue or anything else. But we never know who we are going to work with, who we're going to associate with, and who we are going to come across. And a lot of whether we're successful or not, it might have been years ago, right? It might have been 10 plus years ago. but if they come across you and they're like yeah i remember there's not a bad thing i could say about danny and i, I still come across people like that that everything where there there's a lot of people are like yeah i have nothing bad to say about him and everything he's a great dude and that a solid worker and everything has always been great conversation stuff like that they might not know details but they do know people naturally remember the emotional feeling that you leave with them right? So if you leave a nasty taste in their mouth, they're going to instantly taste that anytime they reassociate or that your name is brought up. And you're not going to please everyone. I will also admit that I am more abrasive than most people. So, um, but a lot of people that truly know me also know that I will take the shirt off my own back and everything to help other people and that, and I will be there if somebody calls. Like that's just who I am as an individual. Um, but they also know that I'm, I don't do the whole emotionally connect or uh, pat you on the back or sympathize or anything else. I'll be like, hey, no, if you want to fix this and that, if you're actually feeling sorry for yourself, like fix it. Otherwise, I don't want to hear your poor pity story. I really don't. Like, right, exactly. my emotional bandwidth doesn't work. <laughs> right. But to your point there, I think it's Teddy Roosevelt, right, that said that uh, people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care right and and so yeah sometimes you know based off of different behavioral styles personality types and things it's like it, it might be a little bit more like, challenging for example, if you kind of, are like this is the the reality is a lot of people think that i'm a jerk right for phrasing something or being like hey i kind of calling it black and white right like you're treating I, it black and white i i look i treat it this way and I, it's the same way that I hope other people will talk to me and that because if I'm playing poor pity victim and everything, 
that's not me taking accountability for my life or being willing to change it or anything else. Um, and that's why usually if something like that happens in my life, I'll ask them. It's like, hey, do you actually want to fix things? Do you want to better your life right now? Or do you just want the sympathy? Sure. Because and some people conversations. Yeah, they right? absolutely are. And some people need to go through the sympathy. Like they don't want anything fixed, right? They're just needing somebody to appreciate the sympathy that they're needing at the moment. And, and maybe sympathy might not be the word or whatnot, but they need to kind of experience that pain at that time before they're ready to get to ground zero to go and rebuild or big fix it or change it, right? Well, it's a lot of people will, and I know that we're kind of diving off onto a, a tangent, but either way, when the going gets tough and everything, the people that are successful, the people that will persevere in that. So if you look even clear back to the Great Depression, right? There was literally people that were working for half of what minimum wage was at that time. And people do not understand how bad that was. Um, there wasn't, there was still successful companies, there were still successful things, but the people that literally they, like they were there there was people that were literally working an entire day just to get a like food just basic food and that just They're to survive and everything they were cleaning they were doing all this other stuff and so if the economy does go in a downward spiral wouldn't it then be fair to say that we need to have skill sets that are valuable even in an economic downturn right the ability to sell, the ability to connect, the ability to fix things. Because, like, for example, there will always need to be plumbing. There will always need to be heating. There will always need to be electricity. There yeah, will always the need to be some of those things. Um, and being able to handle those. And the same thing with sales, right? There's always going to be people that need to bring in business because they understand that it's their livelihood, right? If they don't get sales, they don't do well. Um Yep. And so that is the grit and everything else that I'm talking about. And yes, we can go through times and everything where we say, you know what, poor pity me, this sucks that this happened and everything. But the difference is, again, are you going to keep holding yourself down that and play that card? Because I also know tons of business owners. I know tons of employees that will literally bring up things that happened 20 years ago and still be like, hey, because of so-and-so, it's why I am where I am. I'm like, no, like I could understand if that was a week ago, that might be the reason, right? Yeah. Right. Fucking months, years down the line. And that the only reason it's affected you is for as long as it has for anything else is because your refusal to act. And that's really what it comes down to. So a lot of, again, the hustling and being willing to step up to the plate when everybody else is conservative and very reserved in their uh, actions is what's going to determine if you have the grit to be successful because that is your preparation because it, it's just like missing if you do stock trading right you can catch um you can start seeing a, a downward or upwards trend and everything and then try to catch on for the ride and everything by the time people recognize it though the ride is already usually three quarters of the way over right mm -hmm. Yep. But if you be, get it on because you were preparing and you were looking for it and you were in the grind and you were in part of that, it also means that you were you retained pretty much 100% of that, 100% of that growth. So now you right. have a 3x opportunity over everybody else. That's massive. That's massive. That is the, that, I mean, if you, even if you look at, I, I don't quote me on this, but I believe even like Procter & Gamble, which pretty much owns every toothpaste medical supply like even baby powder all this other crap and that pretty much that everyone that buys universally they were started in the great depression that's more than a 20x advantage over everyone else like right uh, there is no manufacturer in that that can even remotely touch them no it's <laughs> uh i mean yeah great great companies are brought out of uh you know uh crazy times and, and stuff like that. Right. And so uh, maybe we could, uh, is the fact that they were prepared and they executed. Right. Exactly. Prepared to execute. Um, and so let's, let's, 
let's let's end uh let's end it on that note but maybe next time we join we can talk about perhaps something along those lines how to 3x your opportunity over everyone else and better position yourselves during down times what do you think i think that's good so um i'll i'll i'm gonna copyright violate i need somebody here so yeah pay the fee which is uh andy for solace it's like hey that that's three pay the fee so the three things of value that we provided to you and not pay the fee which is just share the show that's uh, right so if you yeah. liked it if you got value out of it share the show so thanks everyone and uh it was a pleasure having you guys see you on the next one thanks guys <laughs>